and turn with me in your Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 12. If you, didn't, if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, we do have paperback versions of the Bible in the back on the table next to Denise and Kathy. Please turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 12. Please join me in prayer. Well, Father in heaven, we come before you this morning with grateful hearts. We sing these songs, Father, in adoration of you, in thanksgiving to you, for you are our God, and we worship you. And so, Father, this morning we come to you as we do each week to hear from your word, to hear from you. So we ask you, God, to please be with us, to fill us with your Holy Spirit afresh this morning, God, as you promised to do that you would help us to hear from you, that you would allow me to speak on your behalf true words that build your church and that glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The book of Acts chapter 12. Please read with me. We'll read the entire chapter. Verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made for him to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought that he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate. Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Tell these things to James and to the others, to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers of what had become of Peter. No small understatement. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. God bless the reading and the preaching of his word. I want to begin this morning by talking about a particular burden that I have for us as the church. I want to talk about a particular challenge that we all experience regularly, perhaps constantly, and that is the feeling of weakness, of limitation, of feeling limited. 
of feeling small and in insignificant, of helplessness, powerlessness, being overwhelmed. As we read about the early church here in Acts chapter 12, we read about a people who were facing a difficulty that was beyond their ability to control. And we can find ourselves likewise regularly overwhelmed by our circumstances, by the size, the momentum of the cultural influence all around us that is dismissive of, sometimes antagonistic toward Christianity. And it can make you think, how am I, how are we going to make any difference in this world? Not only do we seem small, but increasingly we are disregarded, ridiculed, or opposed. And it can simply feel overwhelming at times. We can be aware of our helplessness. And then when Christianity is somewhat noticeable in the world, it can often get confused for some kind of political agenda, which can be very dismaying. You can want to say, no, that's not the Christianity that I believe. That's not the Christianity that I, conf that I confess. Or it can get confused with bad teaching, false teachers that follow, like, Follow Christ and all of your dreams will come true. You will have no trouble. You will pay all your bills on time. You will find the person of your dreams. Everything will work out. And you want to shout, no, that's not my Christianity. That is not what I believe. But often it seems like nobody is listening at all. So it can seem overwhelming at times, like Christianity, real Christianity, is so small and insignificant, how can it really make any difference in this world at all? And then here we are, Sunday after Sunday, gathering together to hear, about the book of, to hear from the book of Acts about the advancing gospel of Jesus Christ. But we can think, well, it's, it's not really my experience in this world. Do you find yourself thinking, it sure doesn't feel like that in my experience? Just overwhelmed by the pervasive secularism, relativism, materialism, hedonism in the world? Secularism, no God. Relativism, there is no right or wrong. Materialism, what really matters is what you get, what you own, my stuff. Or hedonism, what really matters is pleasure. This can be so dismissive of anything that is Christian. As I was studying this passage this week, I was reminded of uh, many moments in, in my you know, vocational history of uh, you know, working in a corporate workplace, being in an environment somewhere um, where on Monday morning, what I hear all around me are the um, you know, people that are just laughing about all their weekend indiscretions without any fear of God or concern about the implications of their actions whatsoever unabashed hedonism, and I found myself thinking, what can I possibly do? What can I possibly say that would help them see the utter vanity of their way of life and the utter beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ? On another front, I'm aware of thousands of false teachers all around the world today, fulfilling the words of 2 Timothy 4.3, which says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. People paying attention to false teachers more for their form of speech than the substance of their speech, or the simple allure of the prosperity gospel or other such heresies. And I, I hear these false teachers on the radio. I see their names quoted in social media or at the top of the Christian booksellers uh, bestsellers list, and I think, what can I possibly do against this? I feel weak, overwhelmed, and helpless. And it can feel a little overwhelming at times, can't it? But God knows that. God knows that, and he knew this with the people in the first century. So he has Luke take up a pen and write a book. He has him include this story, Acts chapter 12, as we know it today, and he pulls the curtains back on this story in the Bible, and he says, let us see this whole thing behind the scenes, as it were. He wants, to, he wants to speak a little perspective into the lives of these early believers and into the lives of us today. He wants to give us perspective. Here is an account given by God to his people who back then were facing challenges just like we are today, different but similar. Christians who felt small and overwhelmed in the face of the pagan Roman culture that was all around them, shaping their worlds and not favorable at all to their Christian faith. And God gives them this book. This book was written 
to build their faith. This book is given to strengthen our faith this morning, to help us to see that despite how it may seem, the gospel is, in fact, advancing. And so this morning, I want us to benefit in the same way from the book of Acts, from this story. I want it to build our faith. That's why it's here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to walk through this story section by section. I'm going to make little observations here and there. I've tried to, uh, at at the end, we're going to just draw a few pastoral implications. I've tried to capture it in three points. We may not have time for three points. We will see. But we're just going to walk through here. And as we do this, I want you to ask, what is God saying to me this morning? How is God, what is God revealing about himself? What is God revealing about the gospel to me this morning? What does God want me to walk away from this morning to build my faith? Those are the questions we should always come to the Bible with. The Bible, as you know, is not given to us primarily for information, but for transformation. It's when we want to ask questions of God's word toward that end. And so we read in verse 1, About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Now, there are a lot of Herods in the Bible, and we don't want to get them confused. This is Herod Agrippa I. All the Herods are pretty bad guys. They're all pretty cruel, pretty treacherous, pretty politically motivated guys. This isn't Herod the Great, who you know uh, had all the babies killed at the time that Jesus was born. It's not uh, Agrippa that we meet later in the book of Acts that, that Paul appears before. Uh, at the Roman tribunal. This Herod is, is one who has a lot of connections, and he was very politically savvy. He was the grandson of the Herod who killed all the babies at the time of Jesus' birth. This Herod knows, knew whose opinion mattered, and so he was very popular among the Jewish people. They liked him. They liked him. And he wanted to maintain that political kind of advantage, that political popularity. And so as this new movement of Christians that the Jewish leadership was so opposed to, as that movement grew, in order to please the Jews, Herod, as we see in verse 1, he laid violent hands on some of those Christians. In fact, as verse 2 tells us, he killed James by the sword. Now, that is very significant because, as you know, James is not the first martyr. We heard a few weeks ago about Stephen, who was the first martyr of the Christian church. However, uh, James is the first of the apostles to be martyred. He's one of the 12 apostles, one of the leaders, one of the key leaders of the Christian, of this small new sect of Christianity. And so Herod turns his eyes toward the apostles. He kills James. And then because he sees that it pleases the Jews that he has done so, he has Peter arrested as well, and you know where that is going. So verse 4, when he had seized Peter, he had put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers. This is four teams of four guys, likely working on four-hour shifts, so that at any given moment they are, they are fresh, they're strong, they're ready to do whatever they need to do to keep Peter under constant guard, securely imprisoned. Now, you can imagine the effect that this would have on the church. There are key leaders being picked off one by one. How devastating, how fear-inducing, how overwhelming this would be. One would only have to imagine uh, our leaders being arrested, being killed, to understand and to appreciate the gravity of this situation. Peter's in prison, but verse 5, while he's in there, earnest prayer was being made to God by the church. The church is praying. You can imagine the fear and the concern and the desperation and the people turn to God in prayer. Earnest prayer. Earnest is a word that, that means stretched out. It's a word that is ordinarily used in medical context uh, to refer to a muscle that is stretched to the limit. This is earnest, all-out, intense prayer prayer that the church is offering up. Gatherings in various houses, people praying together as families. You can imagine uh, the mother working in the home and praying, God, protect that man. You can imagine brothers, friends of Peter's praying, God, protect Peter. Do something good. Show yourself strong on his behalf. We've been praying together as a church for many different needs here lately. We've been, we were praying last night for baby Riley that, uh, that John just gave us an update on. So you can imagine the type of earnest, all-out, intense prayer that the church was giving to God on behalf of Peter. Now, verse 6, the Passover is done. The night before, Herod is planning to bring him out to the people. Now, Herod, as you know, he, he's not going to act 
during Passover because, again, he wants to curry favor with the Jews and they would not want anything to happen during the, the night that they're celebrating uh, the Feast of Unleavened, of Unleavened Bread, the Passover. And that night, God acts. It's a wonderful story. Can you imagine Peter? I imagine Peter telling the story time and again of his miraculous release from prison, his miraculous escape. And so what was Peter doing on the night before he was to be executed? What would you be doing on the night before you were to be put to death? Peter was sleeping. He was sleeping. He was sleeping like a baby. Only a man who has learned to trust a sovereign God could fall asleep in the face of such uncertainty and imminent danger. The night before he's about to be killed, he's sound asleep between two soldiers and an angel shows up in his cell. There's a light and he says to him, arise, Peter, get up. You need to get going. And the chains fall off his hands. So God is at work. The sovereign God is doing something right there in that cell. He sends an angel, not just some apparition, but a real being who wakes Peter up and the chains fall off his hands. Listen, God can do stuff like that. The creator of the world who made the universe and all that is in it can certainly do away with a half inch of iron. Verse 8, the angel said to him, put on your sandals and your cloak, we're heading out. And so he went out and followed him, but Peter did not even realize that this was real. Then they passed the first gate and come to the second gate leading to the city, and it opened of its own accord. It did not. That's what it looked like from Peter's perspective, but God opened that gate. They went out along one street, and the angel leaves him, and the angel takes him out into the city and then leaves him on his own. You know, usually the, the, uh, the escape scenes in books and movies don't look like this. Usually the escape scenes... Um, are told in such a way as to make the escapee, the hero, look amazing, th to leave you impressed with his cunning ability uh, to think his way out of this situation. But this story is told in the exact opposite way. This story is told to illustrate the powerful intervention of God and the utter passivity of Peter. This is not Peter coordinating the grand escape. This is not Peter picking the lock with the key that he had swallowed the night before or stealing the map from the guard when he's not looking and then defeating them in hand-to-hand -hand combat as he uh, runs away, defeating them in a foot race to freedom. That's not what we see. Peter, rather, literally sleepwalks his way to freedom. He escapes Herod's maximum security prison in a state of semi-consciousness. Even the angel has to talk to him. You, you imagine the angel talking to him. As you read these words, you can imagine he's speaking with a level of condescension, like Peter is a small child. He's saying, Peter, it's time to get up. Peter, poking him, put on your shirt and your pants. Peter, don't forget your sandals. We've got to go. Peter, your chains are off. Stand up. Let's go. We're moving out of here. And Peter is just, he's just trying to stick with it. You know, maybe, maybe you understand this. As we see from this section of scripture, Peter is a very deep sleeper. Unless you believe that this, unless you want to cry out, ridiculous, inconceivable. You'd only say that if you've never heard the story of my honeymoon. On the second night of my honeymoon with my wife, on the second night, an alarm goes blaring at 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay? I'm a very deep sleeper. I don't hear the alarm. My new bride nudges me a few times until I arise, and I go, being the man, and across the room, which is on, the alarm clock's on my side of the room, I stumble across through the hotel, and I, I get over to the alarm clock, and I'm, I'm staring at it in a state of semi-consciousness, trying to figure out why is it making this noise. And I press all of the buttons to silence the alarm clock. It stops making noise. And so I go back to bed. I lay down the hero. I have served my new bride. I've shown myself to be the man. Ten minutes later, the noise resumes. I don't hear it. My new bride nudges me again. She elbows me sharply in the ribs. I get up again and I walk across the room and I am puzzled. I thought I defeated this thing. I do the same motions because I've got it, you know, figured out somewhat and it silences again. I go back to bed, lay down. Ten minutes later, you know what happens. 
I get elbowed again. I go across the room. I've got it down now. I know exactly which button, which button to press. I lay back down. Ten minutes later, I kid you not. <laughs> you have no respect for me at this point whatsoever. <laughs> at this point, my new bride leaps out of bed like a gazelle, storming across the room. And I, I realize what's going on. I said, no, no, I've got it. I start stumbling across the room. I am asleep. I am a deep sleeper. But I, something goes in front of me. And now I'm awake. Now I'm like, I'm yelling. And I'm ready. To, there's an intruder in our room. And I'm ready to brawl. And, and I hear this voice saying, it's me. <laughs> and she's wielding a lamp at this point. And she turns the lamp on. And I come to and hyperventilate for the next half hour as I try to come down. And that's not the end of it. She could, she could go talk to her, and you, will, you want all the tales. You can, she'll tell you about a time where she was nursing uh, our second-born son and asked me to go take care of our first-born son who was crying in the middle of the night. And she kept pushing me out of bed, kicking me out of bed, yelling at me like the hero that you know me to be. I dutifully get up and go to take care of our crying child who is scared. But Holly noticed the crying didn't stop. <laughs> totally sleep deprived and still taking care of our newborn child, she finally gets up to go see what was going on. And there I was, your midnight superhero, lying asleep on the floor. <laughs> so I can understand and sympathize with Peter's situation. I hope that some of you can come to me later and say, me too. So I don't feel all alone. <laughs> Verse 11, Peter comes to himself and realizes what's happened. He goes to the house of Mary. And this is fascinating. He knows that Mary's house. I mean, what does it say about Mary that he knows that people would be gathered at Mary's house? It tells us that, that she is a hospital woman who is gathering people there to use her home you know, for the work of the gospel, that people would regularly know that Mary's house is a house of prayer. May our homes be known as houses of prayer. So he goes to Mary's home, knowing that the believers would gather there. He goes there, and this house, like most of the houses, would have been surrounded by an outer courtyard. And that outer courtyard would have a wooden fence, a wooden gate around that courtyard. And so he goes there. You couldn't see over this wall. And so Peter comes, and he knocks at the gate. And you know what happens. Rhoda hears the knocking, comes to answer. And well, what happens now is, well, verse 14, recognizing his voice in her joy, she doesn't open the gate. <laughs> Peter's here. They've been praying for him. He shows up and she leaves him at the gate on the outside of the gate and runs in her joy to tell everyone, Peter's here. Our prayers have been answered. She's so excited. She forgets to let him in. Someone said, someone said here that Rhoda is the archetypal airhead. I think that's accurate. Peter can't see him, but he hears her shouting for joy, and then he hears her little feet running off. He didn't yell, probably because he didn't want to draw attention to himself. He's aware that Herod's police are out there, you know, probably looking for him, and he doesn't want to make too much noise and draw attention. And so she goes in and reports that Peter is outside, and the people say, Hallelujah! No, they don't. They say, You're crazy. It must be his angel. You're, you're, you're nuts. They're praying for Peter to be let loose. He's let loose. And they don't believe it. Meanwhile, Peter keeps knocking. You can imagine what he's thinking. I am miraculously delivered out of this prison, and now I can't get into, the, uh, into this house at, 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 of this prayer meeting at my friend's house. Since when is it easier to escape prison than to enter into a prayer meeting? So Peter is out on the street, and he keeps knocking. He's wondering how long he has before the police catch up to him. Finally, they come out, and at first, they're all dumbfounded. They're all amazed. And then all at once, they're all starting to talk. You can imagine the emotion. You can imagine this morning, you know, spontaneously, as John's giving us a positive report about baby Riley at this point, we spontaneously started applauding. And you can imagine if, if Peter, who is in prison, we're praying for his release, and he comes and, you know, against all disbelief, he, uh, he appears in, uh, in front of us. You can imagine how excited everybody is. You can imagine all the hugs and the, and the you know, clapping and everything, all the excitement that is going on. So they're all talking. And so Peter has to motion to them to be silent uh, while he can relate the story to them of what happened. And so he tells them to tell these things to James. Now, obviously, uh, James the apostle is dead. This is James, the brother of Jesus. 
uh, who will be a leader in the early church. He goes on, he says, tell James and the brothers, and then he leaves, and we don't know where he went, and we won't hear from Peter again until chapter 15 later on. Now look at verse 18 with me. When the next day came, no little disturbance at what happened to Peter. Herod comes and interrogates the guards and kills them as punishment for allowing Peter's escape. And Herod goes down to Caesarea. And that introduces what ends up being almost a footnote to this little story. Look at verse 20. Herod was angry with them. And so they come to him and they, they appeal for peace because their country depended on Herod's country for food. And so on this appointed day, what Herod does is he comes out to meet with them and he puts on this robe. And we have this uh, secular account from a, uh, from a historian named Josephus that describes this robe. And it was quite the robe. It had silver interlining all the robe. And he was facing the west. So when he came out, the sun was hitting him in such a way that the, glo that the robe was radiating. So it was, it was magnificent. It was, it was amazing. It was impressive. So you can understand when the people, when he starts to speak and the people start to shout out the voice of a God and not of a man. And what happens? Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down. Notice, notice that twice in this passage of Scripture, an angel shows up. A being shows up, wants to, uh, to lead Peter's escape from prison, and wants to strike Herod dead. Here's Herod, so intent on shutting down this Christianity thing, so occupied with getting glory for himself, saying, look at me, look at what I've done for you people, look at me, I am godlike, and God strikes him down. My glory I will not share with another, says the Lord. Josephus shares this detailed account of this specific situation. This is important. This is a, a fascinating account from, a, again, a secular historian. He was a Jewish man who was a historian who recorded this event in great detail. He ends this account saying, while he's up there on the throne receiving this praise, he says, at the same time, Herod was seized by a severe pain in his belly, which began with a most violent attack. He was carried quickly into the palace, and when he had suffered continuously for five days from this pain, he died in the 54th year of his age and the seventh year of his reign, dead in five days from the apparent eruption of some kind of wormy cyst in his belly. So there it is. There's the story of what happened at that time in Jerusalem and later in Caesarea. But what are we supposed to get from this? What does God want us to walk away from besides simply saying, well, that, that's a fascinating story. That's a humorous story. There's lots of irony in this story, lots of uh, comedy in the story. But God wants more than comedy or interesting observations. God wants to build our faith. And so with that, I've got two points with you to share with you this morning. And the first is that God delights to answer the prayers of his people. This is one of the greatest things in the life of the believer to realize that no matter how bleak the situation, our God reigns. There is still the power of prayer. There's still a God in heaven who delights to answer the prayers of his people. But let's be honest, in the face of such opposition, when you're sitting there aware of all the cultural hostility toward Christianity or any other situation, when you're sitting outside of a, of a hospital room, when you're, when you're sitting anxiously awaiting the news reports about the devastation from the storm, to pray looks so weak. But it's just so important for us to see that Luke carefully documents this account in such a way that we have to see that what happens is a direct result to the prayers of the church. There's direct correlation and causation listed here in this text. God acted in response to the prayers of his people. This is clearly, or may, maybe, you know, I can understand sometimes how we, we struggle to pray. You know, maybe we've had too many unanswered prayers. Maybe we have prayed for so long for that family member and God hasn't answered. Maybe Maybe we've just lost all hope that he ever will. Maybe we've come to think that it really makes no difference whatsoever. Now, few of us are going to come right out and say such things because we know better, but many of us do feel that way. We've lost confidence in the way that we've been praying. And into those questions, into those doubts, God speaks. God gives us this story. He wants to speak perspective 
into our life, as I mentioned earlier. In this passage, God speaks and he says, let me show you something. Let me tell you what's really happening. Folks, let's not, let's not be guilty of failing to take this for what it is. Luke is saying God responded to the prayers of his people. You know, I used to think when I would read this passage of Scripture that even if the people didn't pray, God would still have delivered Peter from prison because he needed Peter. He wanted Peter to, to do certain things. He had reasons for him. And therefore, it didn't really matter. I mean, it's nice that they prayed. That's a good Christian thing for them to do that shows their devotion. But they didn't really need to pray. But I'm not so sure. that This story doesn't allow for that perspective. It looks pretty clear to me that it mattered that the people prayed. It's miraculous, certainly. But this, this weapon of prayer gets wielded and everything changes. Now notice, I didn't say that God always responds in exactly the same way that we think he should. He doesn't always answer our prayers the way that we want him to. Notice, we, we just kind of glossed over, the text just kind of glosses over, uh, you know, from verse 2 to verse 4, it just almost glossed over the fact that James was killed. James was not delivered physically. So the people are praying, James still gets killed and Peter's released. Well, why James? Why Peter, not James? Why, why couldn't both of them get delivered? Where was God on? Did God, did God fumble the ball on that one? Why, why is that? Well, we don't know. We're not, we're not told. We don't know. What we know is that there is no question that God wants us praying. He tells us, he hears us, he tells us he'll respond. And everything in this passage is a description of God responding to the prayers of his people. Now, this is where we run into a pretty big theological question, right? If God is sovereign in his acting, what really is the purpose of prayer? If God is sovereign and he knows what he's going to do, then what's the purpose of us praying? You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating if you think about the way that Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. He tells them right up front, your Father in heaven knows what you need before you even ask. And so, so then does he say, therefore, you don't need to pray? He doesn't do that. Then he goes in to teach them how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thy on earth as it is in heaven. So, so Jesus teaches them to pray in full acknowledgement of the fact that, that he knows what we need before we even ask. God knew that Peter was in prison and that he was about to be killed. So having said that to his disciples, we think that there's no point in praying whatsoever. But here's a, here's a piece of it. Here's a piece of the, of the mystery of prayer, of so God's sovereignty in our prayer. God, God delights in inviting us into what he's already doing. God delights to invite us into what he's already doing. This week, we went, uh, my family went camping, and we had a kayak out on the lake, and I had my three-year-old, almost four-year-old son out on the kayak with me, and he wanted to row the boat. He wanted to take this oar that was twice as long as he is tall, and he wanted to power and to steer the kayak that we were in. Now, he doesn't have the power to do that on his own, and so what I did is I, I put the oar in his hands, and I put my hands over his hands, and together we rowed. Together we, you know, we, we steered the ship and we powered the boat. And the smile on his face, oh, so much fun. He was in heaven. That's kind of what it's like in prayer. God drawing us in, allowing us to participate in what he's doing. And I love that image because it's so rich with relationships, so rich with uh, pictures of alignment and affection. Folks, God does respond to the prayers of his people. The power of prayer is really the power of God. God is doing the acting. He is the power, but he is drawing us into what he is doing. And so I want to encourage you. I want to exhort you, church, to persevere in earnest prayer, intense, all out, stretched out to the limit prayer. We want to persevere in this area. What a delight it is to pray together in our community groups. What a delight it is to pray before our meeting every Sunday uh, as the church. What a delight to gather together in twos and threes. I love getting text messages from you and phone calls and emails from you asking how you can pray for individuals, asking for updates on the, on the results of your prayers. I love hearing you asking for specific updates from me on ways that you've been praying for me. What an encouragement the gift of prayer is in the life of the believer. 
Prayer can change things because our prayer comes before a powerful God, which leads to my second and final point. The gospel of Jesus Christ will advance against the powers of the world even in the face of opposition from without and from within. We can have confidence, friends, in the triumph of the gospel and the advance in this world because God is all-powerful and His purpose will prevail. I mean, look at what God does here in Acts chapter 12. Peter is miraculously rescued in the face of Herod's power and authority, which are simply nothing before God. God takes Herod's prized prisoner right out from under his nose. Four squads of four soldiers around the clock, two chains, a mighty fortress, and Peter sleepwalks his way out of there. And look what else God does. Herod is judged. He is struck down. God's direct judgment falls upon him. John Piper, pastor and author, said about this section, if you oppose God, you lose. And he's exactly right. This is one of the main points of this passage. The title of this sermon is, Who's Got the Power? And it ain't Herod. We see that time and time again throughout this book. It is simply madness to set yourself up against the creator of the universe. God's judgment fell upon Herod because he glorified himself and not the almighty God of the universe. Another ancient persecutor of the people of God, Antiochus Epiphanes, who in his arrogance had thought uh, to grasp the stars of heaven, was seized by an incurable pain in his bowels and with excruciating internal torture until he died. A book on the Bible and modern medicine describes what happened here to Herod and states that a great many people in Asia harbor intestinal worms, which can form a tight ball and cause acute intestinal obstruction. That may have been the cause of Herod's uh, death. What we know for certain is that he defied God, and for that he was immediately put to death. This passage demonstrates the power and the priority of prayer, but it also shows how God brings acts to bring retribution upon those who oppose him and act for their own glory. Those who set themselves up against God ultimately perish. Oppose God, you lose. But in stark contrast, in stark contrast to the death of Herod, to the death of the tyrant, is Luke's concluding comment that the word of God can continue to increase and spread. It's a complete reversal of the church's situation. John Stott wrote a commentary on this book. And he said, at the beginning of the chapter, Herod is on the rampage, arresting and persecuting church leaders. At the end, he is himself struck down and dies. The chapter opens with James dead, Peter in prison, and Herod triumphing. It closes with Herod dead, Peter free, and the word of God triumphing. Such is the power of God to overthrow hostile human plans and to establish his own in their place. Tyrants may be permitted for a time to boast and bluster, oppressing the church and hindering the spread of the gospel, but they will not last. In the end, their empire will be broken and their, pot and their pride abased. God acts to keep his word going forth, triumphing, advancing in the world. Verse 24, the word of God increased and multiplied. It may look like for a time, that God's plans are being thwarted, but it will not be so. James killed, Peter thrown in prison, two of the 12 apostles and leaders of the church taken out, but no, nothing can stop the good news of Jesus Christ from advancing. This is the theme of our sermon series, the advancing gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the theme of the book of Acts as we see over and over again, the word of God increased and multiplied. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And God means for that truth, friends. Seen here with curtains drawn back, we get to see from a divine perspective, from God's perspective, what it was that he was doing. And God intends that to build our faith. God wants to build your faith. This is not here to entertain us or to build up our knowledge of history. It is here to build our faith that God is at work and to encourage us to enter in to the ever-advancing power of the gospel, to join in with what God is already doing. So church, be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged this morning as we feel weak and insignificant or overwhelmed and limited. 
powerless. God is on his throne. He is not weak. He is not helpless. He is not limited in any way. God is all powerful. He alone has the power. No king like Herod can thwart the plans of our almighty God. Our hope does not reside in any human leader or institution, but in God almighty. So be encouraged. Don't be impressed by temporary worldly triumphs, and they are temporary. They are temporary. We want to be bold and courageous to passionately proclaim the word of God, to pray together with confidence and zeal, knowing that our God delights to answer the prayers of his people and that his gospel will advance, will triumph to the ends of the earth. Please join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that, you're, that you are a speaking God. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through your word and that you speak to us, Father, not just to grow us in our knowledge, Father, but to transform us into your image. You speak to us to build our faith. You speak to us to give us courage and confidence that you are on your throne and that you are always at work for our good. And so, Father, this morning, I do pray that you would do that. I pray for those of us this morning who feel weak, who feel limited, for those of us who feel helpless, powerless, that you would build our faith, that you would give power to our prayers, that we would see you responding God, that we would see your gospel advancing in this world. That we would not be dismayed, discouraged by temporary setbacks. But that our faith and that our joy would be ever out of the reach of our enemies. We pray all this, Father, by the power of your spirit, because of the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.